Okay, welcome everyone to our first monthly Caesar seminar of the year. Um, I'm Hugh Price, I'm the academic director of Caesar. Um, as our main speaker today, I'm very pleased to introduce Kay Firth Butterfield. Um, Kay runs the ethics advisory panel of Lucid, which is a, an AI company based in Austin, Texas. And as most of you will know, if you know anything at all about CESA, the, the relationship between academia and the technology world is something very much at the heart of what CESA is trying to achieve. And so we're delighted today to have a speaker who's addressing the ethical issues from the industry side of the fence, as it were. Although, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a fence we're very keen to make extremely porous, and this kind of event can help to do that. Kay's own background is in law. She had a very successful career as a barrister in the UK and also teaching law at, at a university level. But she also has a, a long-standing interest in the ethical issues uh, associated with artificial intelligence. And for the past 18 months, she's been running the ethics advisory panel at Lucid. I first met Kay um, just over six months ago last June when she and Lucid's CEO, Michael Stewart, came to Margaret Bowden's talk in this series that some of you may also have attended. Um, we talked to dinner after that event uh, and then on several occasions over the summer and I became very impressed indeed with the depth of Kay and Lucid's commitments to taking seriously the ethical issues surrounding AI in the, in the broadest sense. And that period over the summer was also the time when we were putting together our final round application to the Leverhulme Trust for their major research centre scheme. As most of you will know, that application was successful and the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence will be coming into being over the next few months. Uh, based here in Cambridge, but also involving our partners at Oxford, Imperial College and Berkeley. And funded by Leverhulme for, for 10 years. I'm very hopeful that the CFI, as we're calling it, uh, is going to provide further opportunities for collaboration with Kay and with Lucid. And after Kay's talk today, I'm going to join with um, Dr. Adrian Weller from Machine Learning here in Cambridge, who's part of the CFI team here in Cambridge, uh, to, give, to, to give you just a very brief introduction to the, to the goals of the CFI. But for now, please join me in welcoming Kay, who's going to talk to us about her experiences working in this important space and how Lucid sees its challenges. Welcome, Kay. Thank you very much, Hugh. And first of all, let me um, say brilliant that you have the Leverhulme um, Centre for Fu the Future of Intelligence up and running now. So that's a wonderful achievement um, for Cambridge, Oxford, Imperial and Berkeley. And Murray Shanahan from Imperial is here as well. So we fully support that. And I loved your uh, term, porous boundaries between industry and academia. And I think I should, that's a term I'm going to espouse in future. Um, that's, that's wonderful. So by way of introduction, um, I thought today I would like to cover, first of all, Lucid's AI system, um, because there's a lot of discussion about different types of AI in the media today. And so I thought it would help you to understand what I personally um, work with. And then I want to talk to you about the Lucid Ethics Advisory Panel and a little bit about the work that we are hoping to do with these porous borders between academia, industry, government and international regulation um, that may be ahead of us, certainly in some areas like lethal autonomous weapons systems. So first of all, I'd like to talk to you about the machine itself. So it's been in development um, for the last 36 years. So we're not new. Um, the chief scientist is a gentleman called Doug Leonard. And I think um, many believed that either he couldn't succeed or he wouldn't succeed with the way that he was designing his AI. And um, Doug 
is often quick to point out things he can't do rather than things he can do. Um, anyway, he, we, we now have success after these 36 years. And um, what we have is an artificial intelligence name, which we call Psych. So I might refer it to it as Lucid's artificial intelligence or Psych, same thing. And what it does is reason across a structured knowledge base and in certain circumstances gathers information from the net. Um, what it then does is that it uses that information and makes causal inferences across any data, um, not only to um, tell the what, but also the how and why the answer is important to you and why it's the right answer. After it's done that, it'll provide us with a logic chain to show us why this, it, it places this answer at number one answer, but you could have number two answer or number three answer. So there's a logic chain there, so we can check how it's thinking. Um, to give you an example of this, the one that I like best is the fly. So if a fly lands in an alcoholic beverage, will it get drunk? Now that's a question you can probably all answer quite easily. But um, it's quite difficult for a computer. And what, you, what the computer has to be able to do is to know the two aspects of the word drunk. It needs to understand the fly's metabolism and it needs to understand the word alcohol and what that means in, in the smaller and wider context. So um, in answer to that question, Psych probably would come up with, well, does come up with, um, if a fly lands in an alcoholic beverage, it may die of drowning. That's one scenario. It cannot get drunk because it's, it doesn't metabolize alcohol in the same way that we do, so it just can't get drunk because it understands the um, structure of the fly. But if someone comes along and drinks the alcoholic beverage with the fly in it, then the fly will get drunk. <laughs> so that's a sort of fairly simple um, way of explaining to you that it can tell me why it, made, it came to those conclusions. Um, it can do more difficult questions, more complex questions, obviously. And one that was put to us by um, one of the founders of Caesar the, during summer was the question of if a ball is thrown onto a table, which will break, if any? And so then you have to ask, the computer has to work out that, run a number of scenarios of where, what the table's made of and what the ball's made of, and then test those scenarios. I think for me, the uh, the, obviously it was interesting that it was able to do that, but the interesting thing for me was that it also came up with some um, sci-fi compounds as well that the table or the ball might be made of, so, um, and tested those as well. However, what our um, machine can't do is it can't identify the photograph of a cat. That's the expertise of different AIs. What it could do is it could tell you that a cat has fur and four legs and eyes and is mortal and therefore will die, those sort of things. So it can tell you about a cat, but it won't identify the pictures of a cat. Um, and it only uses machine learning in the way of um, speeding up its way of getting to an answer. And so it's not machine learning it's a different system entirely of artificial intelligence. So let me move on to the ethics advisory panel and tell you a little bit about the history. Well, um, Hugh mentioned Michael Stewart, who is the founder, uh, chairman, and CEO of what is currently a privately held company, um, the name of Lucid. And if he were here today, he would say that he hasn't spent 27 years of his life creating something that is going to harm our planet, or at least he certainly hopes not. 
And so that's really how he got into conversation with me about the ethics advisory panel. We met in June of 2014 and started having discussions about what an ethics advisory panel would look like. And um, what we, we were starting from scratch because we didn't know of any other structures. And so it very soon became clear that his idea of what an ethics advisory panel and mine, my idea were actually very similar. So that was a great basis for us to be able to move forward. Um, I am not an ethics and compliance officer. Um, I, my job is, so, is completely different from that. And so um, what we, having talked together, we came up with a number of things that were really important. important. For example, securing the independence of the Ethics Advisory Board and also um, being, making sure that the EAP was in place before our go-to-market strategy um, came into place and we started producing products commercially. And so that happened in 2015. I was employed in October of 2014. Now, if we think about um, the way in which um, we envisioned the EAP, the EAP has an internal structure and an internal face into Lucid, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And it has the external face, of which this is a, this is a good example. I, uh, we have always felt at Lucid that our EAP should be a public thing, and we should engage with governments and academics and other people in the industry and the public. Um, in our conversations around ethics and AI. And so, as I say, this speech is an example of that, but also working um, with the Lever Human Centre for the Future of Intelligence, with CESA, um, with the Future of Life Institute, with IEEE, which is an industry standards group, which you may have heard of, other, and other interested bodies that we feel is the way that we can contribute to the public debate around ethics and AI. Um, our website, which is newly launched yesterday, um, actually has a whole page devoted to the EAP. So we're very interested in, in engaging with, with other parties in this space. So Michael would describe, and I, I'll read the quote, um, the EAP as an entity which needs to be respected and renowned for its independence, expertise, ability to, to influence decision-making within Lucid, and for its reports which take thinking forward on uses of AI. In other words, it is essential for Lucid to fully realise its potential. And I hear similar comments uh, as I work in the office. Um, we're passionate about using AI to do good, and we know that using AI to do good for the benefit of humanity has all sorts of connotations. And if we just benefit humanity, do we not benefit our planet? And so again, those are conversations that we're, we're keen to have. Um, to that end, there are open versions of Psych and there are research versions of Psych. And the latter is widely used in universities and hospitals, um, for example, in such diverse ways as planning smart cities to helping with cancer research. So how does the EAP function? The EAP is going to be a collection of about 12 people from various areas of expertise, and they range from obviously artificial intelligence scientists through to obviously ethics um, folk and international lawyers, international politicians, um, or in, in the work, people working in the realm of international politics, uh, children's rights, uh, a diverse group um, representing those who may be affected as AI rolls out in the future. 
as a mark of Lucid's dedication to the EAP, not only was I recruited before the go-to-market, but I'm also a C-suite officer. And um, in the discussions that we had, we felt that for me to have true independence and for us to have a truly independent EAP, that was a key um, part of the key piece of the jigsaw. Um, although Michael at the moment is both CEO and chairman, I actually report to the chairman of the board. I have observer status on the board and um, my employment can only be terminated by the board. Um, but as a C-suite officer, I get to go to those management meetings so I know what's going on within Lucid as well. Um, the EAP provides guidance for Lucid. Um, it liaises with Lucid on internal ethics. Uh, it, the, and by the EAP in this context, I mean my team, me at the moment, and hopefully in the future some admin assistance I could do with that. Um, and so I'm the middle of the interface between the EAP and, and Lucid itself. And we are keen to address issues within the public domain as well. The EAP has its own budget, which again was a thing that we felt was fairly was vital to ensure independence. So I get my budget and I can spend it as I wish, um, within reason. And so um, what we'd like to do is to be a resource, um, not only for the company, but for others in the space. So at Lucid, we believe in transparency, and we believe that those of us who are in a mature industry um, should act maturely, and we should, do, we should not only believe in such regulation, but actually do it. And so that's really where the ethics advisory panel comes in. So in summary, the EAP helps to create a climate within and without Lucid, whereby the potential for Psyche to work alongside humans to enable the use of such an AI in new and beneficial ways is realised. And I'd just like to take a moment to read to you our ethics position statement at Lucid, um, which I hope will draw together the disparate things I've been talking about today. Um, so... The, in the preamble, the Lucid EAP will lead the company's research of and positional guidance on ethical issues that may arise from the application of our AI technologies, assuring and amplifying trust in Lucid solutions by our industry, government and individual consumers is a key objective. The external purpose, so the reason I'm here, we are assembling a group of renowned ethicists, futurists, and industry and government experts to serve on the Lucid EAP to help guide and advise the company and to work interactively with the world's leading external organizations pursuing global standard setting for ethical issues within the AI, AI industry. Internally, the AAP will have meaningful internal insights into Lucid's product, sales and marketing directions so that it can provide valuable guidance and education on potential ethical implications, offering such guidance to the Lucid team to amplify the company's growth and profitability. So a word about profitability and ethics. Many people sort of say, oh dear, profitability and ethics. Uh, but uh, we are a business and um, we do have a duty to our shareholders. We're an American company. We have a duty to our shareholders to maximize profits. But at least we know that um, the best way to do that is not to behave unethically. And so the EAP fits very well into that situation. Additionally, I am tasked with seeking, seeking <coughs> engagements to help use AI, our AI for good. And so one thing that I'm particularly delighted about is that we are now working with a major information supplier to create an app which knows the customer and supplier. 
And one of the things that this application will do is to check the supply chain for human trafficking. Now, as somebody who's written and researched extensively in the human trafficking area, this pleases me enormously. I will finish up with telling you a little bit about our current EAP members and then just looking a little bit to the future. I hope that I'm not running over my time. So, as I said, we will eventually have 12 members, but at the moment we have five. Um, we believe that AI is handled correctly, a gift to the future generations. And so my first recruit was actually um, a person who used to be head of policy at UNICEF. She's a child rights person. Her name's Elizabeth Gibbons, and she now works as a visiting scientist at the Harvard FXB Health and Human Rights School. Uh, John Harris, who is a philosopher and has written a number of books, amongst them Enhancing Evolution, is, was my second recruit. Um, he's worked in bioethics for a long time, and I think that bioethics may help us to think about some of the ways that we look at AI for the future. And so that's why I choose him. The third member of the team is Derek Jinks. He is a co-author of the Talon Manual. Some of you may not know the Talon Manual, but the Talon Manual is an attempt to apply Geneva Convention rules to cyber war. And so with that background, I felt that he was a super person to have on the EAP. My fourth recruit was Murray Shanahan, who probably needs no um, introduction in this audience, but I do recommend, if you haven't read it already, to read his recent book, The Te Technical Singularity. And my fifth member is Max Tegmark, who is a professor of cosmology at MIT, but also notable in this space as being the founder or a co-founder of the Future of Life Institute and Director of Foundational Questions Institute at MIT. So the last area of my speech is really how are we see going forward with the EAP to amplify and support the work of others in this space, and particularly the Lever-Hume Center for the Future of Intelligence. As I've said repeatedly, I think it's important that we all have conversations in this space. I don't think any of us can go it alone. And um, I think the more that we bring great minds together, the better chances we have of dealing with the um, coming disruptions that AI will cause. Uh, there are legal implications. I'm a lawyer, as Hugh said. There are in legal implications just around the corner and so I'm particularly delighted to be able to have spent some time yesterday talking to Tom Grant, who will hold the legal part of the Leverhulme CFI's um, grant. I'm, I also teach a course for the University of Texas Law School, which is called Law and Policy of AI and Emerging Technologies. And um, they are about on the 3rd of February to, to start a center which is dedicated to that area of the study of law. And we're really pleased to already have amongst our speakers Hugh Price. Um, and again, I think that's a great example of the interaction that, that we see playing out as um, time goes by. So, with that, I will stop. I'm sure there may be questions, but I believe that Adrian is going to address you first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, before we open things up for general discussion, um, I wanted just to take this opportunity, together with Adrian, to say a few words about the conception and vision and aims of the new Levy-Hume Centre. Um, this is the first um, sort of public opportunity we in CESA have to speak about it since we got the wonderful news that Levy-Hume had ag agreed to fund us. As you probably all know, the background here is a growing realisation that with the development 
of high-level AI, we humans may be approaching one of the major events in the history of our species. It's our own intelligence, more than anything else, that makes us who we are. And many experts think that we're likely to be able to make non-biological versions of that intelligence or comparably powerful forms of intelligence, perhaps over the remaining decades of this century. And the timing is, of course, very uncertain. But one thing that's not uncertain is that we're only just We've only just begun the process of thinking about what these developments will mean for us and about what we can do to ensure that we get it right, whatever that means in this case. I mean, it's, it's, it's not even clear what the good outcomes will look like. So we're at the very early stages of thinking about those issues. But one of the things that's changed since the last time we humans encountered something this big, perhaps the first Industrial Revolution, is that the academy is a lot bigger. So in the universities and research institutions of the world, there's a vast resource of intelligence and expertise, some of which is sure to be helpful um, if we could succeed in steering its attention to the challenges of making the best of this new revolution. And even better, it's a continually renewing resource with many thousands of brilliant new, brilliant new minds entering relevant fields every year. Imagine if we could succeed in steering the imagination and brilliance of some of those minds into thinking about the challenges and opportunities of AI. Then we'd have what we need, some of the best of human intelligence, fascinated by the challenges of making the best of artificial intelligence. So that's the vision behind the Levy Hume Center for the Future of Intelligence. Above all else, it's a project about academic engineering, about designing and building the new academic community tailor-made for these challenges and encouraging it to grow as quickly and effectively as possible. Or think of it again as, as steering. As a species, we need to steer the transition to an era in which we share the planet with high-level non-biological intelligence. As academics, uh, think of us as a small but lovable subspecies within the bigger species. We can hope to do something more modest. We can try to steer our own community towards what it needs to be to make an effective contribution to the bigger project. And that's where the, the Levy Hume CFI comes in. That's where we can make a difference, I think. Now, to make this work, we need to reach out into many disciplines to find the researchers and students whose skills and interests will be relevant. But which disciplines and which people? Well, we simply don't know that in advance, not only for the obvious reason that we don't know everybody or what they're good at, but for also for an important but non-obvious reason. We can be pretty sure that in some cases we couldn't even tell that a particular set of skills would be relevant because that fact simply isn't visible until those people get involved and tell us why their skills are relevant. So we don't know what questions we should be asking in some cases. So we need to, to find a way of reaching out into these various academic disciplines that doesn't depend on being steered from the centre and whose boundaries are not constrained in advance because we don't know where the boundaries should be. And my model for thinking about something like that is the root structure of a, of a plant, a healthy plant, which is sort of growing in, whose roots are growing in many directions. And a large component of the CFI will be a collection of sub-projects which together will act like a, a root structure reaching out into various disciplines, finding people with relevant interests and connecting them to the growing community as a whole. Each of these sub-projects will run for three years, employing one or in many cases more postdocs. Uh, and there'll be three of these three-year phases over the 10-year life of the centre as a whole. There are seven sub-projects in the first phase, I won't, I won't list them all, uh, and we expect there to be more in later phases as we find additional sources of funding. So one of the good things about this root structure model is that it's easily extendable in that way. And we'll have an open competition for sub-project funding in later phases, again as a way of encouraging people from other disciplines, people we don't know about yet, to reach out to us. In the first phase, some of the sub-projects are based in Cambridge, some in our partner institutions in Oxford, Imperial and Berkeley. 
with, with most bridging institutions in various ways, and many bridge disciplines as well. And there'll also be many links between subprojects. And one of the roles of the, of the central structure will be to encourage those links and thus make the growing community even more highly connected than it would otherwise be. Each of the sub-projects has a coordinator, and in a moment I'll introduce um, Adrian Weller, who's coordinator of one of the seven sub-projects in the first phase. But before I do that, let me just briefly finish by mentioning two other elements of the overall model. I mentioned one of them earlier, a strong emphasis on attracting brilliant young scholars to the field. And one mechanism we'll be using to do that will be an annual summer school. I'm very confident in, indeed that in the decades ahead, many of the alumni of these summer schools will be some of the, the brightest stars in this new community. And second, and tying back to Kay's talk, another big priority for the CFI will be what I think of as its vertical links, its links to the technology world in one direction and to the world of policy in the other. And the importance of those kinds of links is very much on display in the sub-project that Adrian coordinates, which is called Trust and Transparency. I'm delighted to introduce Adrian to tell us about it. Adrian has been a supporter of CESA almost from the beginning. And in fact, I think he may have been the very first person who wrote to me in support of CESA in the summer of 2012 when we just set up our first version, our first crude version of a, a web page after Jan Tallinn and I had bought the domain, domain name CESA.org for $1,200 from a domain squatter in New Jersey. That, that was a bargain, I think. Adrian, welcome. Thank you so much for your unwavering support over that period and for all your help in the Lady Team application. Welcome. Thanks very much, Hugh. And yes, I certainly am a supporter, and I hope we can convince all of you to be keen supporters also. Um, and I'd also like to start by, by additionally welcoming and applauding Kay. It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing to see a, um, a significant company being so transparent and open about their efforts on ethics. And um, we hope that lots of other companies might follow their lead. So it's really wonderful to see that. We're very excited about participating together. Um, first, I might suggest a question which I think is perhaps one of the deepest and most fascinating questions for mankind. That question is, what is human intelligence? So how does it work um, and, uh, and, and what exactly is it? And clearly that's, that's a very profound and deep question. Hugh knows more about it probably than, than most of us here. But the question is matched and perhaps even superseded by a, an even more general question, which is what is intelligence? whether it's human or not. It's a very, very big and, and very tough question. And it's fantastic that we're going to be able to think about that question in this new Leverhulme Center. And I think we should thank Hugh and Sean and the Leverhulme Trust and, and all the people involved in setting it up. It's really a wonderful achievement. Now, intelligence clearly can be a great power. Uh, it creates all kinds of wonderful opportunities and certainly we don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. Everyone is very excited about the wonderful things that we can do with artificial intelligence, and many of us are working on those things. But at the same time, with, with great power, as we know, comes great responsibility. And we need to be very careful about how this power gets used. So as with any other powerful technology, AI could be used for good or for bad, and we should strive hard to ensure that it's used for the benefit of society. And some aspects that make that perhaps particularly challenging for AI are, um, well, there's several. I'll just mention a two, I'll mention two of them right off the bat. One is it raises important moral questions which perhaps aren't so clear in other areas. So we have to start asking the question, how should an artificial agent behave? And that's, that's one of the reasons that's tough is that after thousands of years of thinking about it, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we figured out how humans should behave yet, never mind superhuman intelligences. So it raises interesting questions back on our own behavior as we explore how artificial intelligences might behave. So that's a tough and fascinating area. Another difficult question is what do we mean by the benefit for society? So of course, we all want to avoid a, a, some kind of terminate a horrible scenario, and we hope and expect that's unlikely. We'll try to make sure that doesn't happen. But even beyond that, there are some very tricky questions. Um, many people 
imagine that we may get many robot workers taking over jobs from a large fraction of the population over the next few decades. And that we would expect to increase the total economic pie. So as a whole, we'd be better off, but it might tremendously increase inequality. And that requires a lot of careful thinking and planning. So what I thought I might do next is, is talk about a few of the near term and longer term challenges that we're going to be interested in, in considering. Um, and then I'll speak specifically about the topics we'll look at in the sub project that I'll be working with. So these topics came up as part of a symposium that um, we organized, co-organized at NIPS in December. There's actually a video available if you'd like to take a look. Murray was very involved in it, Sean was involved in it, and several other people here. Um, but I'll just briefly mention some of these issues. We might talk more about them later on. So in the near term, I suggest that some of the very important issues, perhaps actually less directly connected to artificial intelligence than just with the progress of technology. One of them um, is going to be legal challenges. And Kay is certainly very well placed to think about those. So in the near future, or even perhaps now, we have already legal issues around drones and um, cars, which are starting to become autonomous. And rapidly, we, we think we should expect that we'll have many issues around liability uh, and other complicated legal issues. And we need to start thinking about those now, because the pace at which those issues are going to come on is going to be very fast. So there'll be many challenges there. Another topic is economic issues. As I mentioned before, uh, many people are concerned about jobs, how those are going to be affected by technology. And although it's true that people have been worried about technology causing trouble for workers going back hundreds of years, Arguably, now, these changes are happening at an ever-increasing pace, and that causes greater difficulties than ever before. And certainly, it would be wise for us to be thinking about those and trying to plan ahead. Another issue, which is already important and is only going to become more important, relates to data. So as a society, clearly, we can, we can gain great benefits by sharing data among us. For example, uh, health records. We can develop new cures if we can gather together data across many people. But we need to be very careful to make sure that's done responsibly and that privacy is, is, um, is preserved in responsible ways. So I think these three areas, legal, economic, and data, are all clear challenges. And they also demonstrate that it's going to take an effort across society to try to tackle these. We're going to need people with technical skills, particularly maybe in data privacy areas, but also legal scholars, economic scholars, and generally uh, they're going to be political issues, which we need to explore together. Certainly in academia and in industry, but really across all of society. In the longer term, I'll mention a few areas, and then, and then I'll focus on the, the ones which we're going to look at in, in my sub-project. So security, um, security of artificial agents and also of ourselves protecting against malevolent agents. So many people have talked about the Internet of Things, that many of the devices which we which we think of as being just physical objects, are going to be increasingly connected to each other and to the internet. And that makes them much more useful, but also makes them vulnerable to attack. So we need to think carefully about preserving security. Already a big issue, only going to become a, a bigger issue. Another issue which I touched on at the beginning, the values. So how can we start to think about what values we want artificial agents to have? And even if we can figure that out, which is a very challenging problem, how are we going to be able to get those into a system so that it's going to follow them. It's sometimes called the value loading problem. In addition, related to values, but also related to anything else we want an agent to do, there's, there's a, a, a problem called verifi verifiability. So how are we going to be able to tell whether an agent is doing what we really want it to be doing? And control is an issue that many people talk about. So how can we make sure that uh, an agent might not be able to go beyond our control, and we may not we may go off and start doing something which we don't want it to do, and we won't be able to turn it off or, or tell it to do something different. So these are all important areas. Now I'm going to speak to the particular ones which I'll be working with as a sub-project, but I'm sure that as an institution we're going to be looking at all of these and, and more. So um, I'm going to be working in an area which, we're, which is going to focus on trust and transparency. This covers quite a wide range of things. Transparency certainly speaks directly to this issue of transparency and interpretability of algorithms, which Kay touched on before. So as she mentioned, when their, when their program does something, it can give you the, the logic chain explaining the reasoning for why they do it. But that isn't necessarily always the case. So in machine learning, we often build systems which are trained on some test set and then perform on a, on a training set or in the real world. And if they perform well, then generally you're quite happy with them. But we may not have any understanding, really, of what they're doing, sort of black box systems. 
And in some cases, that might be particularly problematic. It might be problematic from a legal sense or just in the sense of can we actually trust, trust it to, 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 to do something for us if we don't really understand what it's doing. And just as one topic within that, there can be interesting trade-offs. So we may really want to understand what it's doing, but what if doing that appears with high probability to give us a worse algorithm? So if we could have self-driving cars, which might kill one person in a million and be able to explain what they're doing, or kill one person in 10 million and not explain what they're doing, which of those do we prefer? And there, there, there are difficult questions there. So. One of the important questions with trust is: Do you trust? Do you trust that it's going to? Do you trust a, a, an agent or an algorithm to perform well? As one example, would you get on a, a plane which is being completely flown by an artificial agent? And I think that really gets to an issue of: um, Can you be sure that the algorithm is robustly going to perform well, no matter what sort of things it comes across? So as I said before, in machine learning, often we train on some training set, and we test on some test set, but what if it go then goes out in the real world and it comes across a setting which is very different to anything it's seen before? So one of the things we want to work on is, is can we, at a minimum, make algorithms which are context aware so they can tell if the environment which they're operating in is very different to the one in which they were trained, and then it could give an alert and perhaps go to a, a fallback safe mode, or even better, might we be able to give some sort of certificate that it's going to perform to some minimum level of, of performance, even if it's in a completely unforeseen environment? And then one other area that we are going to try, go, we're going to explore and will be very interesting to think about um, relates to trust in as much as trust in some sense is the opposite of deception. So if we would like machines reliably to be able to anticipate human needs and desires, then we might like them to be able to understand our emotions, have a sort of theory of mind. And if, if we can do that, then they'll be able to do nice things for us. But on the other hand, it'll also empower them to be able potentially to manipulate and deceive us. And what can we do to try to prevent that from happening? So those, those are some of our areas. Um, I just, I'd finish by emphasizing that as a, as a society, we know that we need to get this right. If, if, we're, going to, if we're going to try to build um, intelligence, which is going to be close to as powerful as humanity, we may not get a second chance. So we really all need to work together to try to get it right. And uh, that makes it a particular pleasure to be able to, to join in the effort with the Leverhulme Centre and our partners. Thank you. OK, so we, we now have um, time to open things up for discussion. I'm going to act uh, uh, as a chair for the discussion. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, please raise your hand. Uh, and if, if there are a lot of hands, I'll, I'll, I'll start to make a cue. Um, and, and please try to speak up. Uh, if you've been to our previous events, you'll know that sometimes we have a, a, a wireless uh, mic to go around the room. We don't have one in this case, but uh, the acoustics are good in here. So if you speak up, we'll be able to get you recorded on the video. Jane, you're the first. Oh, thank you very much. It's absolutely fascinating idea. Can I, I just get Oscar? It's mm -hmm. about Lucy. Um, would I be right to think? that in effect what Lucid is doing is an enormously powerful kind of expert system. I mean, that it's, it's working with information which is, exists in the form of written or digitized or whatever. It exists in the form of symbols. And it, what, what, it, what it does is, in response to the input question, somehow search an absolutely enormous amount of stuff of that kind and come up with this relevant answer. And so it's a... It searches its knowledge base, which has been created base, over right. the th past so, 36 so it years. Does, but it doesn't do it. It, doesn't, it offers you up this, the fly will get drunk, or not this one, maybe, <laughs> or will be drunk in... Anyhow, it offers that fascinating answer. Um, but it doesn't itself initiate things. It doesn't do things. That, be? that would be so correct. It's, it's up to the human agent then to act, who would ask the question. Yes. Then to act. So it's, it's not autonomous. It's not, so it's interestingly different from, would that be right, to put it to Jake and some of the other kinds of systems which are trained to do, do things in response to the information that they. Would that be? Yes. Right. <laughs> so I'm sort of less. No, I mean, am I naive? I'm less worried about that than I am about some of the other kinds of... <laughs> yes, so, I mean, 
<laughs> so, I mean, is there an interesting, I, mean, I suppose I'm most opening up the question, is there an interesting contrast between kinds of AI here and the ones that just help us organise our knowledge even better? I mean, I can see there are pitfalls there because we might ask silly questions and get caught in sort of dead ends and fail to, ourselves as questioners fail to, or become caught in the, <coughs> in the sort of group mindset with some AI system and so on. I can see plenty of dif the difficulties there, but they seem to be different from the kind of problems Whereas by AI you might get with things that actually go out and turn electricity systems on and off or all that kind of thing. With actual delegation. Actual delegation. Mm -hmm. that, that, I guess, that, thank you very much. And that's the, so I'm just in, sort of, any thoughts people have about those? Kind of so I think that's largely true. Um, I, I just mentioned one reason perhaps to be a little bit less complacent than we hope we can be. Uh -huh. And Murray might amplify on this if you would like. Um, but just one one thing to note is that over time, if you had a system which was tremendously good at answering questions, and it was doing that in a way to what, as we would think as from human terms, sort of subconsciously achieve some goal. So if, if you have an agent which is told to do something, um, it might, through trying to achieve that goal, be giving you answers which makes other weird things happen, which you might not want. So you may think that it's totally disconnected from the real world, but still, if, even if all it's doing is giving you answers to questions, that may somehow lead to bad results. So you can't be completely complacent about it. And, and perhaps if, if I could just follow up there and, and, I, and sort of ask Kay a, a, a follow-up question. I mean, I presume it's the case that, that psych could be used as an input into something which was an autonomous agent of some kind. And so that in, that, in that sense, the, the you know, issues about whether it was giving the right information and so on would become relevant to something that was actually doing something. So the, the I mean, if, and if that's right, then, then this is a, a sort of second reason for thinking that the, um, the, the, the piece that might come with, with, with um, what you were suggesting, Jane, that the idea that it's not actually doing something is is a little bit illusory, but because the, the better it is, the, the the more temptation there will be to hook it up to things that that, that do do things. And I, that's one of the reasons that the EAP exists, yeah. so that we can think about those issues. Okay, so now I'm getting a forest of hands. I'll start making a list, but I think I saw yours first. Uh, other people, could you keep up your hands, and, and then I'll, I'll I'll try and make it. Cute. But you go ahead. I, I just got the impression from the last speaker, sorry, I didn't catch a minute, that there seems to be a certain amount of asymmetry between the ethics of statistical machine intelligence and the ethics of symbolic um, symbolic systems of the kind that psyche is. Um, one particular area that interests me in this is the use of, for example, statistical machine intelligence for social policy. For example, oh, where are all the poor people? Oh, well, we optimise there. <laughs> um, and just a, this is a bit of an open-ended question, but just a bit of a comment on how you feel about about that. I'm happy to. Yeah, Adrian, yes, I, uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good point, and I don't think there's any blanket answer. Um, so it is true that methods which are entirely statistical have different properties in a sense to systems which are completely symbolic and which we can understand well um, and it's great to have the whole range to be able to think about and, and potentially play with they have various advantages and disadvantages it's actually quite exciting to think about combining them together not with sandy hughes concern um, which we have to be careful about <laughs> but it ir irrespective of the issue about which kind of machine learning system we're dealing with there are very challenging political and societal questions that are implicit in, in, in your question. How should poor people be dealt with? What should society do? And I think it's very important that we engage everyone in, in continuing to think about that and making sure that we protect the weak, weakest people in society. Um, I don't, don't know what else to say. Absolutely. Um, I heard recently about an application, um, and I heard it, so um, I'm not telling you that this is gospel. I heard recently about an application that's being used in New Zealand um, to work out the statistical probability of 
child abuse happening in homes. And I think that that's very interesting and potentially worrying because we need to be very careful about the parameters that we set there. Um, you, sir. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for this talk. I would repeat all the aspects I like, but I feel that I've reached pitch late when I said it's full. Um, my question is sort of related to things you mentioned at the top of the programme about producing a poor accord between academia and industry. I wonder what your thoughts are of it, of sort of introducing collaboration between industry players, because of course the sort of movement to have like more ethics involvement in AI is being repeated elsewhere. So think of like Dennis has had this in DeepMind or indeed OpenAI, which was recently launched. And that's sort of nascent attempts at ethics committee. It would seem very valuable for these groups to collaborate, like sharing best practice, collaborate cross pollination, and so forth. Have there been efforts along these lines, and are you hoping to make some? Oh, yeah, uh, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, so, for example, I am currently serving on the steering committee of the IEEE's. Um, effort to begin to think about setting some standards for their members who work in this industry. Um, someone from my company and a lot of people met in New York two weeks ago, I think now, um, to talk about some of these issues. And I would be very pleased to collaborate with anybody in industry who would like to. Yes. And if I could just say something for, from, from the Lady Hume Centre's point of view, yes, I mean, that's obviously something that we are very keen to, to do too. And if there's a role that we can play as a facilitator of those sorts of conversations, um, and, and you know, the Lady Hume CFI itself is new, but, but, but um, 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 we've already been involved in those sorts of conversations. Uh, I mean, for example, the, the, the meeting that, that Adrian mentioned that he and Murray and others were very much involved in organizing at the, the NIPS meeting in Montreal late last year. Um, so so that, no, this is, this is, it's a very, what you raise is a very important thing. It's very important that, that as it were, it's not just academic groups that should collaborate on this, but the industry groups should collaborate as much as possible insofar as you know, commercial confidentiality requires, and, and that's very much a part of the model. And I think just taking up Hugh's point about commercial confidentiality, obviously there is com huge commercial confidentiality, but we could sort of begin to have talk talks at the top level um, where we don't impinge upon those things. Yeah. Um, I think you, sir, were the next on my list. You know, the question is basically how, why, why. The question also arises when. At what stage, when the autonomous agents start behaving, even if we thought we trust them for a longer period, it comes in time. And what about that one? When it happens? So that's one of anticipation which needs to be studied. And the question arises when? And then the question is suppose we trust, suppose we know for even in them. I suppose we know the AI agent or the behavior. Suppose. Then the question arises how the symbiotic relationship between the human agent and the machine AI agent work. How it work? What trust do we have in that? When we trust them, we're always caring about in healthcare and welfare and all the things. We will design tools and the humans will make judgment. The question is when we start accepting the judgment, even of the agents or even from the agents, stage comes when we don't know how it's going to act. At that moment, we lose our own confidence in our own judgment. And that's dangerous. It's at what stage we lose our own confidence in making judgment. Adrian, do you want, it sounds to me like that's related to trust and transparency. Well, sure, I, then you've raised excellent questions. I, I don't you object to the very beginning of what you said, where you said, well, we think we know how. I don't think we have any idea how. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, the, the when is a very interesting question. Uh, from many perspectives, you might say that we're already in the period. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of debate about what does it mean to reach human level, uh, human level intelligence, how do you define that? Um, is that really the important thing anyway, 
Or is it perhaps more important to know when do we start to have machines which are able to be somewhat autonomous and to develop themselves further or develop themselves further in combination with humans? That's already happening. And we already have machines which are significantly better than humans at all sorts of things. Um, but humans are much better at a range of things for at least the foreseeable future. Um, the issue of trust as we enter a period where they're more equal to us is fascinating and I agree it's very challenging and one fairly one example which may happen fairly soon perhaps relates again to, to autonomous cars so Tesla now have this uh, ability where you can just upgrade the software in your car and you can be driving along and you, I don't know if you press a button or you say something I don't know quite how it works does anyone have a Tesla but you, sw you switch to a, an automatic mode and it takes over and it's driving. Uh, for now, I understand that you clearly have the legal liability. You are the one in control, but you don't actually have to do anything, but you should stay there just in case. But if, if it changes from being just a temporary thing for 10 seconds to being something which will go on for 10 minutes, then I think it's going to be difficult to expect the human to pay attention all the time. And they're going to start to turn around and start to have a chat with someone <clears> in the back. And then you have exactly this issue. Well, now if, if you have some bump in the road, is it reasonable to think that the person can quickly turn back and take over, or is that going to be more dangerous than letting the machine keep control? So these sorts of questions are going to be on us very soon, if not already. Um, I think a very similar sort of issue comes up when you talk about aircraft. It's increasing, obviously increasing waves of autopilot in airplanes, mainly because these things are safer. Um, there's increasing worries that we need like, de-skilled human pilots so that because they're relying on autopilot so much, when things untoward happen, um, they are less able, they are less equipped to do. I mean, that maybe yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the classic human factors paper from uh, maybe 1956. This is a classic old argument, and you were exactly right. That's the, you know, how do you manage the the, dis the moment when the machine does so much that the, the human starts getting distracted? And it's a classic human factors problem. I mean, you know, paper is a, is a real ancient problem. There's a great paper by a lady which is the most cited. <laughs> okay, let's let's go back to our queue. You're, you're the next. Uh, no, my question was about the uh, going back to the time when the, the, the board was being set up. I'm wondering what sort of mandate the board might have been encouraged to feel that it had for that conceivable crunch time when the commercial exigencies of the company are tending one way, and the advisors are saying, "Well, hold on a second, that's not quite what we had in mind." What what are you what do you feel you can or should do at the moment right now? Well, that's. At that stage, my um, job is to report what the what either I or the EAP and I feel um, to the board, and then of course because in, because we're a commercial company, that it's for the board to make the ultimate decision. Um, okay, so let's see who's next. No, you're the next on my list, but was the comment you just made what you wanted? No, no, no. My, my comment was, um, I think James, James Trade in the back here has been fussing about words. And um, I mean this affectionately. Um, <laughs> um, and then the next comment was very interesting, because what I pointed out was that you can do really powerfully interesting things with statistics. And statistical engines are a great tool in the new sociology. But I want to listen to what you're doing here, and I listen also to companies who, who the purveyors of AI, is that they use the word intelligence as what Austin would call a trouser word. And a trouser word is something which kind of crowds out other sorts of things. And it seems to me I, I worry, and I want to see what the response is, is how can you make sure you're careful in your grinding down to the particularities of problem spaces when you're sometimes crowded into the, the, the excitement and the, and the kind of foggy vision that goes with the word intelligence. So for example, I drive a car, a pretty fancy car, and it has loads of systems on it, which are probabilistic machine engines, adjust the suspension, adjust the feel of my speed, my uh, the steering column, it adjusts my fuel. None of those systems are called intelligence systems, but it doesn't matter to me whether they're called intelligent systems or not. They're prosaic engineered problems, solved in prosaic ways, that might or might not have ethical considerations for me. But my, my, my worry for the projects like your own is how do you tame trouser words like intelligence so that you can answer questions which distinguish between the effective use and clever use of intelligence statistical systems 
on those technologies which miraculously do do something, which dazzles, which makes you think, oh, I think differently what I'm touching something. Well, perhaps I, I could pick up on that from a philosophical point of view. And what I want to say, agreeing with you, I think, is, is, is what I, I'm inclined to say to people who say in a, in a, in a skeptical tone, why are you setting up a center for the future of intelligence when we don't even know what intelligence is? And, and I'm inclined to say, well, look, I'm a philosophical pragmatist. I think, but I say, don't think about what intelligence is. Think about what it does. And so to you, I want to say, look, the answer is forget about the trouser work. Think, of, think about what these different systems are doing in, in each of those cases. And keep an eye on that, because that's going to be the things, thing that, that matters in the end with our interaction with them. Um, I don't know if anybody else want, wants to pick up on that one. We've, we've still got quite a long queue. And the next person, you, sir. Well, yeah. Yes, yes in um, the blue shirt, yes. So, uh, and I've got you as well. In, uh, in Adrian's overview of, of CESA's activities, um, I think that uh, Professor Hill's suggestion that um, perhaps symbolic systems such as like are, are not problematic as machine learning based systems, like that's personally certainly my view. Um, but uh, Adrian then said actually he listed a whole lot of problems in different areas of computer science that had ethical implications. Uh, and I would certainly agree that uh, the ethics of computer systems and network systems and information systems are a major concern for modern society. I'd say what part of modern society actually is not affected by those questions. So uh, I'm the chair of the Cambridge Computer Science Ethics uh, Review Panel, uh, so I regularly have occasion to review ethical problems about technology use. Um, and I have to say that in this university, the Artificial Intelligence Group is the one that troubles us least, to be honest. Little that they do has any ethical significance, um, whereas many other areas are extremely <laughs> important. And that leads me to ask the question, um, why would so much be invested in a particular area which from my embedded perspective is actually um, not a real problem at all? Um, and what motivations could there be? And of course a cynic could say um, maybe it's in the interest of some people to distract attention from the real problems um, by focusing on a, on a, a vision of science fiction. Well, I mean, of course, the, the science fiction su suggestion comes up a lot. And, and uh, as I think I mentioned in my introductory remarks, there, there are huge disagree disagreements among experts about what sorts of possible timetables we're looking at. And, and pe pe people I now know, estimates range for estimates, say, for human level general intelligence, range from something like 25 or 30 years at one end to never at, at the other. Um, um, if, if, if you do studies look for medians, you find something in the latter part of this century. How useful is that? I don't know. But it does seem to me, now looking at it from, from a philosopher's point of view, that the, the prospect that there is something very big there at, at something like that point in our future is an important enough one for us to start thinking seriously about it rather than wait for it to take us by surprise. And that, that combined with the thought that um, even if we never get to, to something like human level general intelligence in a machine, we're going to get to things which can do a lot more than, than even the machines that we have now. And of course, many of them are pretty remarkable. Yeah, wait, wait, so, so, so these shorter term things are definitely going to be on the table. I simply say there are actually other worse problems yeah. So, so, but, but that comes. So that, why, yeah. But I, I want. I want to come to that too. So but because my my. Yeah. Well, but but my and the other thing I wanted to say is that, um, I mean, the other, my other response. I mean, I think of my role in this as I also use the term academic engineer, or sometimes I call myself an enabler. So my enabler's response is to want to talk to you, find out what these other problems are, and see how they connect to the space of problems that we're thinking about. And, and and not think of it as, as as two separate issues, but 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 as different parts of the same issue. Um, okay, so I, I'm also enabling something else, which is a, a, a fair way of monitoring this discussion. So the next person is the person in red at the back. Yes. Yeah, just as a side about the previous question, actually, um, I, I seem to remember that um, when H. G. Wells wrote about an atomic bomb in about 1910. 
I think that was before the term science fiction was invented. But they used to call them scientific romances, I think, at that point. But of course, it would be very easy to, to say exactly that about H.G. Well, as it happened, he was broadly right, except his bond went off rather slowly, I seem to recall. Uh, but my, my actual, as opposed to the real one, uh, my, my, my actual question uh, was, was more about, in some, I mean, you've alluded to this already, that we, we already live in an age of weak AI, if you like. You know, everything from the bubbles, that's, the filter bubbles that surround what we read online, to um, you know what we can and can't buy in the shops, what our electronic you know uncles choose for us for our next purchase, and numerous things are already what anybody fifty years ago would have called AI. Um, there are obvious ethical questions around all of that. Um, uh, you know, especially if you're say a ground floor work worker in Amazon or something. You know, who might otherwise not have a job, of course. Um, where does your, your space, as, as you keep calling it, um, where, where does the space of the discourse around all this connect with those questions of the now? Okay, maybe what I could say in, in relation to that is, is some, something that I say in, in um, relation to Caesar. C Caesar's interest is uh, the, the sort of specific focus is on very serious risks arising as unintended byproducts of, of beneficial technologies such as AI or um, or synthetic biology, for example. Um, now, um, and, and the Levy Hume Center's uh, interests are in one sense narrower because it's just AI, but in another sense much broader because we're not just focusing on the extreme risks, but on the general question of how we maximize benefits. Okay, but in, in the Caesar space, in, in thinking, I mean, there too, I, I, I tend to see it as, as this sort of academic engineering. And I think of our relationship with, with the other disciplines that need, we need to connect to. In those disciplines, there are going to be people, people with, with broader concerns, but concerns which overlap with this particular problem of how do we manage this class of technological risks in various ways. So what we want as, as, as a kind of model for the, for the kind of um, academic institution we're building is, again, we want porous links to all of those disciplines. Um, and so where there are um, links of the kind you envisage, I mean, sort of academic synergies as it were, we, we, we want to make use of those and try and ensure that we have um, good conversations taking place with, with the, the, the people who don't have our specific focus but who are interested in some relevant issue. And one way that will happen is that as we appoint postdocs to our sub-projects, they will come from some of those other disciplines. Many of them will go back to those disciplines and have brilliant careers there, but they will take back to those disciplines some of the interest in the specific issues. And this is true both for CESAR and for the new Levy Hume Center. Um, so, the, the, I mean, the, the, what we're aiming for is, is, is a, a model in which, as far as possible, there are no fences. I'm not sure whether that helps. And, well, I was thinking more as a world beyond the academic level because I was just, I was just curious as to how, how you feel ethics. It's a rather open-ended question, but how ethics works in the, the current AI world as opposed to the future AI world, you know, the world, the world in which we are, you know, have been embedded for the last 10 to 20 years. <laughs> you know, the, the foothills of the AI revolution <laughs> on which we now live as opposed to the, this interesting future that you're discussing. Uh, well, um, I, I'm not sure in, in, in what sense you're asking ab about how it works. And also, I, I'm, I'm inclined to, to hand over to, to right. Kay, who's obviously much more of an expert than me about how it actually works uh, in, in the real world. <laughs> OK, um, I'll catch that ball. Uh, so I, I think where I, as a lawyer, um, looking at this, um, uh, I think where we are focusing with the law school is on some of the more immediate concerns that um, Adrian enunciated earlier, you know, um, the Tesla example that you used, um, tortious liabilities around, for example, autonomous vehicles, uh, criminal liabilities in certain cases the the classic um who do, who should the car kill 
in in given circumstances those sort of things which are questions that really will be upon us very soon if not now um, and so I don't know whether that helps you but certainly we are beginning we're, we're, we're looking at the issues that are lying on the upper foothills if I can yeah, put it that way I think it's, it's, it's a little bit too vague, yeah. but if, if you identify specific concerns yeah. and come to us as a, either as a person who, yeah. who, 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 who works on those concerns or as a person who wants to introduce us to people who do, then I'm sure we can find the, the, the kind of uh, links that I was talking about before. And, and with my enablers hat on, I will be interested in the question as to how our, you know, our fo the questions we focus on connect with the questions that those people are focused on. Okay, um, did you have a question, sir? Yeah, the question is whether uh, Lucid as yet has a set of guiding <coughs> principles for deciding what is ethical and what is not. I mean, more from a philosophical point of view. The answer is no. Um, the answer is that we are still in the early stages of doing that. Um, currently, we have not come across problems. You know, as I say, we've just done a done an application with, or are in the process of doing an application on human trafficking. Um, that's not something that I'm going to trouble the EAP with, and currently, I haven't troubled the EAP with anything, but we do need to sit down and begin to think about guidelines. But I'm a great believer in soft guidelines, um, which is probably wrong because I'm a lawyer and so therefore I should be, th be thinking in, in different terms. But um, I also know that if you set um, strict guidelines, it tends to encourage people to look for ways that they can get around them. Um. Uh, uh, Martin, d despite the fact that it's you, I'm going to, uh, in the interest of equity, I'm going to put you on my cue. Um, <laughs> and the next person is the oh, you, sir. Thanks. So I have two uh, project specific questions to uh, Mr. Bruce Whitefield. So the first one is uh, it's quite encouraging and also one brief thing to see the progress led by EPA in acquiring forming the uh, ethical codes in the field of. Um, AI. So during your point of experience as a lawyer, as a judge in court, and also teaching academia, what's your approach to writing the laws um, in the field of AI? And also the third one is that in forming a panel of child Greek minds uh, in your field, um, I'm sure that when this uh, child professional um, coming together, um, the discussion will be highly intelligent, but also involving much uncertainty. So what is your thinking on effectively integrating their advice, their thoughts into the delivery you want to make um, from this project. Okay, so your first question was about um, my my job as a lawyer uh, and I teaching. Think, um, leveraging your um, legal services um, or your legal career, uh, what is your approach to um, forming or, or substantiating the law or the ethical codes in the field of AI. Okay, so one of the things that I think we need to look at in terms of law, and uh, I've been doing some work just recently, I am a member of the Inner Temple here in England, and so I've also been trying to encourage practitioners to begin to think about these issues as well, because they're going to be at the coalface when some of these, um, these things come up. And what I'm encouraging my students to do in the current course that I'm teaching is to look at um, whether the law as it is at the moment, for example, in respect of um, negligence and car accidents, 
whether that's applic that's still applic that will still be applicable in terms of autonomous vehicles or to really focus on how that might change and what policy or what new laws might be needed or whether they whether the change can be effected through um, court so precedent so building upon the current law that we've got um, your second question just yes, help uh, me with that again Okay, so as time goes by, I will be um, calling upon <laughs> EAP members to write papers on specific things. Um, currently, the only example that I've got of that is that um, I actually um, wrote a number of thought pieces and then sought opinions on those thought pieces from the EAP. So it's me going to them um, and asking them for help. And um, I think I probably mentioned in my speech that we, that my company signed the Future of Life's um, let, Future of Life Institute's letter in relation to using lethal, using the AI in offensive lethal autonomous weapons systems, um, and so that was an uh, that was a way, with that we talked about it within the company, we then asked for advice with the, from the EAP and then Michael, subsequent, Michael Stewart on behalf of the company subsequently um, signed that letter. So I hope that gives you some flavor. So the other day I was uh, speaking with a league, uh, friend in the legal field about um, some of the issues that you raised through artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and especially legal and ethical issues. And I was really interested that Rightly or wrongly, he wasn't so concerned about groups losing out for children, whoever, but he was very concerned about uh, legal aspects when it comes to the artificial intelligence itself. Should very advanced artificial intelligence have some rights of its own? So my question is whether the, the, ethics, the ethics Advisory Board or the League of Youth Centre plans to look into those sorts of questions. Um, well, one of the things that we as lawyers think about is legal personhood. Um, and that's really because uh, you can't commit a tort at the moment unless you have legal personhood. And if, if a machine, say a robot, doesn't have that legal personhood, then um, who, who, who owns that tortious liability and how do we connect that? So uh, to that extent, yes, we're we are already thinking around those sort of things, but um, yes, I know there's been a lot written about um, whether robots should be. Nick Bostrom, for example, has written about whether robots should have um, human rights, and um, I think we're at a point where, at the moment, we're not thinking about that. At least, I don't know about the Leader Human Centre. Um, I, I think it's something that, that we, we sort of have on, on the radar at, at the sort of far end of, of the spectrum. Uh, it, I think it's conceivable that, that it will turn out to, to have um, shorter term Im implications in the sense that questions about safe de development paths will, will, will turn out to be connected to the question as to whether we should be developing something that we can always think of as just an instrument or a tool that we can keep in a box, or whether we should be thinking of something which will act and need to be treated like a moral agent or a person in that sense. So I, I, I think that um, um, that will certainly be something that will come up for discussion within, well, f for example, um, one of the sub-projects in, um, in the first phase of the Leverhulme project, the sub-project that I'm the coordinator for is called um, agents and persons, if I remember rightly. Now, there are a number of different issues that come under that, but, but that sort of issue is one of them. Um, Martin, you're next. Mm -hmm. There's a comment from the perspective of CESA in general, uh, which is that uh, we are concerned about prudence as well as ethics. And I think there's an analogy between the uh, bio area and the bio 
science, people have addressed both about the ethical issues and about the prudential issues and the dangers. And I suppose the uh, um, underlying agenda really is whether it's premature or not to consider both those things in the context of uh, um, AI and computers. And the other point I want to make is that the focus of CEDA is going to be on the uh, um, horizon, I mean the uh, uh, long-term high consequence, low consequence rates, simply because the near term is being more intensely studied. And we think that it's worth having at least a dozen people in the world thinking about these more uh, longer term issues, uh, longer term than the standard bioethics communities are addressing. We've seen them in a big way and ditto in the computer area. So I would say that our distinctive role is to think about the longer term future <coughs> and to try and advise on what can be dismissed as science fiction and what may have to be worried about and where we do need to already think about disruptive innovation, but also uh, be able to think about what is prudent as well as what is ethical. And the focus today is on the ethics, but the prudence is part of the ethics. Um, Pardon. Uh, so it's a very practical question. Um, when, um, and the head of the Health of Justice, uh, at what points in the R&D, research and development stages, is risk assessed and um, the question of ethics brought up? Uh, and is the stage in which it is assessed, uh, does that stage depend on uh, how large the consequences are and um, how much infrastructure is required in order for those consequences to have an effect. Because it seems like that's one of the issues that a recurring uh, concern or a, a recurring um, point that is made is that uh, if we have a technology that has a lot of potential for harm with little infrastructure required in order for it to take effect, that that should be assessed before research and development um, begin. Whereas for something else, like a drug that requires a lot of infrastructure, it's okay to develop it and then assess. Um, I think that um, from that, in answer to that, I, I would say that most companies would not want to put in a lot of R&D to something where there is a potential that that product would not be acceptable to the general public or to the um, the person to the the air the general uh, people to whom it's going to be sold and so most companies would be sensible to um, consider the ethical implications at a very early stage of that R&D. Okay um, we're almost out of time but did, did, did you have a question? Okay, so let me see if I, how many I can remember. There's, there, there are seven projects and, and two sort of um, smaller things, sort of research exercises. The research exercises, one is on horizon scanning, trying to get a better sense of possible roadmaps for, for AI development, and, and that will be, uh, I mean, in CESA we have very good links with a, um, a horizon scanning team here in Cambridge, uh, and, and so this will be an exercise that we could repeat at various stages during the tenure. And then, then the, the other um, research exercise is, is will involve a, a workshop on autonomous weapons. And then the, the sub-projects, um, the ones that have been mentioned so far, uh, the one for which I'm the coordinator on um, 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 agents and persons, there's trust and transparency. Um, there's one for which Marta is the coordinator called Kinds of Intelligence. There's one which connects up with uh, work on the science of value, coordinated by, by two colleagues of Marta's in history and philosophy of science. Um, there's a large one based in Oxford and um, Berkeley on um, the, the, the value alignment problem. That's the problem that Adrian spoke about. Um, how many is that? That's about, that's five. <laughs> Oh, that's right. So, so, so there's one for which the coordinator is David Runciman in Polis uh, on sort of issues of AI and democracy, uh, and that's both to do with, with 
whether our democratic systems are adequate for dealing with these challenges and what the effects of the, the AI expert systems will be on democratic systems. Uh, oh, and then there's the one for which Sean is the coordinator. Policy and innovation. Pardon? Policy and research. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say. So the, the one for which Sean is, is, is the um, coordinator, uh, policy and responsible innovation. So that's the, that's the full set. Okay, um, I think um, successful, um, successfully dealing with that challenge to my memory is a, <laughs> is a good place to stop. Um, thank you um, all for a, a wonderful discussion, and please join me in thanking Adrian and Kay very warmly indeed.